This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another nor despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, a pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. <laughs> All right, over to you. Okay. Well, tonight, perhaps we can talk about relationships in life. Not only relationships with each other, but relationships with the, the larger world itself. Because really, this is a major part of human life and what it is to be human is our relationships. There's so much going on there. But at the same time, from a meditation and dharma point of view, there's a lot going on there which is a bit problematic, which is why we often fall into trouble. Because there's some vested interests and all kinds of problems going on in the background that very often we're not aware of. And that can obstruct and hinder and destroy, in many cases, our relationships and poison them completely. And we can look at two very simple rules that pretty much rule all our relationships and they are basically operating in behind the scenes both speak. we're not always aware that we're doing this so this is a very simple little experiment that we can try how many of our relationships that you can think of operate on two simple rules the first rule is we like people because they make us feel safe and comfortable they make us feel pleasant and that they give us what we want or enable us to get what we want. And we don't like people who don't make us feel safe and protected, who make us feel uncomfortable, and who don't give us what we want, and who obstruct us from getting what we want. <laughs> when you really think about it, a great deal of the relationships and the way that we treat people and interact with people, and the expectations that we have from people, basically fit into those vested interests. But this has a lot of problems in the world. And there's a lot of reasons why this is essentially doomed to failure. This is why we don't really have great quality of relationships, great quality of life. Because we're all looking for you know, happiness, well-being, meaningful life, quality of life, and all that kind of stuff. And yet, this, what we're doing is these vested interests behind our relationships are undermining that. They're making our relationships superficial. They're making our relationships very one-sided. It's all about me. And unfortunately, the worst part of it 
is that these vested interests are very relative. They change. So what I want today is going to be different from what I want tomorrow, and what I want today is different from what I wanted last week. We change all the time. And when the other person in our life isn't able to fit into our current vested interests, we lose interest in them. We no longer love them. And this is a bit of a tragedy because we're being ruled by vested interests, which aren't really in our best interests. They're going to hinder our, our well-being in our lives and how we interact with people. The problem basically is, we talked uh, last time about uh, uh, the heart and how opening the heart can be a bit of a rocky road at times, a bit bumpy. And that's because there's those three main problems that the heart has is that it's very naive, it's very volatile, it's very turbulent. But the fourth one that I didn't talk about, which we can talk about tonight, is it's very vulnerable. It's hurt very easily. So it changes very, very quickly. And the reason, when we look at these, these simple rules that basically undermine our, our relationships and what we expect from people, from a Buddhist point of view, it goes right to the heart of Buddhism. Because this is what the three characteristics are about. The first one of, of these rules, so to speak, we want to feel safe and protected, and yet everything is impermanent. We want to feel pleasant and comfortable and everything else, and yet what is impermanent is unpleasant. <laughs> it's, it's chaos, it's suffering. That's the problem, it's dukkha. And what we want, the third part of the rules, is to get what we want or have other people enable us to get what we want, and yet it's anatta. These things are not under our control. We can't just snap our fingers and get what we want. And so basically the way that we interact with the world and with other people is entirely to try and prevent being exposed to the three characteristics of life. The impermanence and change and uncertainty, the unpleasantness and the, the suffering and the dissatisfaction, all those, all those words. Very big umbrella term, this. And then the lack of control and lack of being able to get what we want at our free will. So the solution to this is, again, this thing called Sati Sampajanya, which we talked about last time. And Sati Sampajanya is one of those things where it's two word ideas that the Buddha has welded together. And he actually does this quite a lot in the text. Unfortunately, you kind of have to be a bit familiar with Pali to be able to spot them when you're sort of seeing two very different ideas here that is really linked together. Because when we teach Pali terms in a context like this, we just present it as if it's just always been that way and that's just how it is. But these are very two separate things. The mindfulness that is fully wise, fully informed. And we're bringing those together and making those one thing. And that, when we bring that into our relationships, all of a sudden we realize that we don't need to be ruled by these vested interests. We don't need to shape our relationships according to, you know, this person didn't give me what I want so I don't like them, or, you know, oh, this person made me feel good today so I love them forever until they don't give me what I want. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing. This wisdom and mindfulness comes in that we can say, okay, perhaps there's more to this. Perhaps there's another way that we can live our lives, live our relationships, whether they're meaningful, where they enrich our lives, whether they improve over time, that the more we get to know each other, because this is not just relationships, husband, wife, but you know, parent, child, and co-workers, and all our relationships with friends, family, the whole works, all of them can be improved by not having to follow these vested interests. But of course, that takes time, you know, we have to get that mindfulness going and everything else to be able to find these vested interests in the first place. But straight away, we bring that kindness and compassion into the picture. This is where it becomes so useful. But it's not something that we kind of do, as in it's not kind of a, a secret spice that we add into the recipe. All of a sudden, meta and compassion and the joy and the acceptance and everything else, the open heart, heartedness, we could say, comes into the relationship because now it's a rational thing to do. 
Now, it's an intelligent thing to do. It's a practical and, you know, life-enriching thing to do. And these are where these things become relevant. So when our relationships basically feel stagnant and we take people for granted, again, when we start meditating, we, we often have to ask the question, how do I interact with other people? Do I just interact with them as if they're just these things in the background that you know, I only interact with when I need them? Or do I treat them as fellow beings in the world? Fellow beings who have their own wishes for happiness and their own hopes and dreams and fears and regrets and everything else, perfectly human. How do we interact? We change all this and all of a sudden we can communicate with each other better. We can listen to each other better. But of course, the mindfulness and wisdom comes in also to say, what is the quality of this relationship all about anyway? You know, there are things, you know, called marriages of convenience where they're not really built to be a relationship. They're just things we do for convenience sake. And then, of course, there are toxic and unhealthy relationships where you can do your best in that situation, but they're, they're never going to improve. They're never going to be wholesome or fulfilling or all the words we'd like. We can never fix them. And that's, of course, when we have to bring in that mindfulness and wisdom sort of saying, well, what is the best solution for this? Is it the right thing to do? Is it rational? Is it a compassionate thing to do to stay in toxic relationships or to indulge people essentially giving alcohol to the alcoholic because it seems kind even though it's not well informed? And all of a sudden this mindfulness and wisdom coming into our relationships shapes how we interact with the world because these little vested interests aren't controlling us so much. It doesn't matter if we don't get what we want. We do sometimes, we don't sometimes, but having to have everything we want all the time would make life boring. It really would. We wouldn't value it. When you think about it, climbing to the top of a great big mountain and seeing the view from there changes your life. And it's a beautiful thing. Yes, we have to come down from the mountain, but the memory of that changes us. Whereas you just go onto the top of a small little molehill or you know, a local little mound and just go, yeah, well, that was fun and what now? It doesn't really change anything. And that's why doing those things that are difficult makes our life meaningful. We value them more and it makes life interesting. If we just do easy things, life gets boring. And then what? You know, that filters into our relationships, that filters into our life. Everything becomes boring. We really don't care. And what happens in the heart is that it feels empty. It feels disappointed. The heart is vulnerable. And when it's hurt, it can be filled with resentment and bitterness and anger and grief and heartbreak. And it doesn't have to be. Things are good, things are bad. It doesn't matter so much. It's just part of life. And this is where the meditation comes in. This is where the loving kindness and compassion and the joy and the open-heartedness comes in. That we can really be there in the present moment. Because we don't need to run anywhere. We don't have to be so worried about the impermanence, the unpleasantness, the fact that things aren't under our control. Because they aren't. <laughs> they aren't under our control. Whether we get some moments in our life where everything goes smoothly, what, what's our instant reaction when, when things go well? I want more of that. Right? Can every moment be like this? Can I always have it? How can I make it every moment be under my control? Really, that things go our way, more often than not, is just coincidence. But we misread that and think that, oh, it's possible to control the world. It's possible to get what I want. Therefore, I must learn how to do it. I must try harder to get what I want. And of course, that just sends us in a loop of uh, basically self-destruction eventually because it doesn't go anywhere. And it's, this is really, when we look at it, these are the patterns that the majority of the world is stuck in. So many people, they're trying to do their best. They want to be happy. They want to have a meaningful and fulfilled life. They want to have a quality of life. And yet we human beings so often do the 
the very thing that's going to undermine that, the very thing that's going to prevent that. And then we think, oh, we just have to try harder, we just have to get more, we have to do this, we have to get that. When realistically, that's not necessarily going to work. So it's all about improving what we have. It's all about being here more. With that kindness and compassion, bringing that into the present moment, with the wisdom and mindfulness, bringing these things together, solves so many problems because then we're not so worried. We're not, so, we're not going to blame ourselves so much that things didn't go our way. They weren't under our control in the first place. So how much of it should we blame ourselves for the rest of our lives for the smallest of all mistakes? Or indeed in our relationships, blame the other person for the rest of our lives because they weren't able to give us what we want. And that's how we can forgive each other better. And we can grow together better. Relationships is a wonderful thing as part of life. And they're everywhere. But at the same time, it's all about what we do with them. It's all about what we make of them. And really, the potential is huge. But of course, this is a two-way thing as well. So if you're fortunate enough that your partner is, or well, you know, the, the other person in the, uh, in the relationship, whether it's your child or your parent or your co-worker, is interested in improving a relationship, wonderful. If they're not, that's fine. We can, start, we can move around these things. But we don't have to feel let down. We don't have to sort of feel that, oh, you know, we didn't get the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It doesn't really exist. <laughs> it's just a dream. And so part of the whole practice of meditation is a waking up from the dream. And when the dream is over, what we have is that open-heartedness. That's the place where you know, loving kindness and compassion and the joy can flow freely because it doesn't have any vested interest behind it. It doesn't have a need to be there. We're not doing it to be good little Buddhists. We're not doing it to, for the hope of getting this or that or by being a good person, I can get the other person to be nice to me and behave and not cause me trouble, which of course is the same vested interest as before. That's freedom. And that's so wonderful. And how much further do we need, really? That's the thing. When relationships flower on their own, there's the joy and the wonder in just that, in just seeing where they go. They don't have to go anywhere. But it's just being with another person and, of course, the relationship with ourselves. Just being with ourselves becomes wonderful. You don't need anything else. All the things that we look for from another person, that fulfillment, you know, taking away the, the misery, the disappointment, the regrets. We have within ourselves the potential to basically fill that hole. Because the thing that makes the hole is this idea that I need this, I want that, me, 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 me which actually comes from how we experience the impermanence, how we experience the unpleasant points of life, how we experience the fact that things aren't under our control and in many ways things you know, look like absolute chaos at times. How do we interact with that? Because when we can't interact with those in a wise way, in an intelligent way, we put up defense, defenses, we put up the fortress, we put up the firewall, we put up all those things to defend ourselves. And when we're trying to operate from this lonely tower, this lonely sort of bastillion trying to protect ourselves, it's a horrible life. It's a prison. You know, we don't need to be in a prison. And the problem is, do we drag the people in our lives into that prison as well? Maybe we might be thinking, to protect them, but sometimes we're doing it because we want them there with us. And unfortunately, we're making them prisoners of our invested interests and our own fears as well. And when we start to bring in that mindfulness and wisdom together, as well as the compassion and the joy and all the rest, we start to realize that we never needed to be in a prison. 
We never needed to be in a fortress. What are we trying to protect ourselves from? Yes, in the world. The world is a harsh place. The world is a difficult place. Lots of chaos, lots of problems, lots of conflicts. Yeah, that's how it is. That's not a failure of the world. That's not a failure of us. But we learn to navigate it better. We learn to interact with it better. Our relationship with the world no longer is trying to fight off the world and control it and protect ourselves. We just do the best we can with it intelligently and, of course, compassionately. Because that is what enriches our lives, those quality of mind. Because the mind in Buddhism predicates everything. It comes before everything else. From our mind, we talk. From our state of mind, we talk. From the state of our mind, we act. From the state of our mind, we create things. We feel this according to the state of our mind. right? Because if the state of our mind feels this is threatening, this is unpleasant, then we're going to feel it as unpleasant. And this is the thing. The other problem with our vested interests is that very often they're naive and ignorant too. I remember many years ago, a person that I first met, well, it's many, many years ago when I was at school, and I instantly didn't like this person. I kind of felt this vibe against them that we really aren't going to get along well. You know, they had sort of this tough persona kind of thing where they needed to be in control and everything else. And I just felt, oh, you know, I'm not really wanting to get into a friendship or interaction with that person. Surprise, surprise, that person turned out to be very, very helpful. They were one of the first people to come that when I was having difficulty in the project I was working on, they came and helped me out. Even though I didn't think they would, life surprises us. A lot of the times the people that we think are sort of not our kind of person, very often we're misjudging them. And of course a lot of the times that we're misjudging people positively when really we should be a bit more careful with them, such as entering into sort of toxic relationships because it looks so wonderful. This is the thing. If the heart wasn't naive, sp scammers, con artists, frauds, they'd be out of business. <laughs> we wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be able to get to us if we, if we weren't vulnerable. And that's the thing. We're vulnerable because we want the hole to be filled. We want that happiness. We want that meaningfulness. We want the emptiness to go away. And yet, we're making it into something, into an enemy that it really isn't. So in many ways, our life can be improved very, very easily. Our life can be far more meaningful, far better quality, very easily just by adjusting our state of mind according to seeing things as they really are. In terms of seeing things with that mindfulness and wisdom, that fully wise mindfulness. And life becomes so much more enjoyable. And happiness comes just naturally. So, that's about half an hour. I'm pretty much on the way out on this, on this, uh, this thread. Shall we jump into some meditation? Sounds great. <laughs> it's really good. Marvellous. Well, as usual, everyone, please stand up and give yourself a bit of a stretch and adjust your clothes if you need to and do all the things you need to do to be able to settle down and get comfy. <laughs> Funny thing is, straight away, we're, we're improving our relationship. We're with ourselves and with our meditation is that we're setting ourselves in nice and comfortable for a meditation. There we go. Easy. <laughs> so, when you're ready, please close your eyes and settle in. And start by taking a few deep, comfortable breaths and let the air flow in and flow out, nice and comfortable. Just for the, del the delight of being here.
Just breathing in and out, fully relaxing, letting go of all the troubles. See if you can find a delight in the breath. How wonderful it is just to breathe. And with each in-breath, soak the body and mind with comfort, with happiness. And as you breathe out, breathe out the tension and the troubles. Imagine the breath filling every part of your body. And as it does, let the tension just melt away. If you need to adjust your legs or your arms, please do so. The first few minutes are perfect time. Adjusting them now helps us to relax deeper into the meditation.
Try to stay in contact with the delight. The delightful breath. If it helps, imagine it as a light or as some feeling that spreads through you. So that the, the delight, the happiness of meditation can grow. If your mind wanders off, is it because you have lost the delight? When just this moment is beautiful, the mind doesn't want to be anywhere but here.
And now let us use the meditation time as a mirror, as a reflection of our interaction, our relationship with ourselves. Is the meditation comfortable? Is the meditation delightful? How we interact with the meditation is how we interact with ourselves. If the meditation has been difficult or unpleasant, then this is a chance to bring in some kindness. To bring in some compassion that the heart needs. What is it that the heart needs? Spend a few minutes investigating that question. What is it that the heart needs? And we'll finish the meditation with the intention of kindness to ourselves to give the heart what it needs. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be free from trouble. and share that feeling with the people closest to us. May they be happy. May they be healthy. May we improve our relationships with those that we care about. And send the feeling to people we don't like so much, who we aren't comfortable with, and who don't give us what we want. May they be happy. May they be healthy. And maybe one day, maybe, may we be better friends.
And we'll now bring the meditation to a close. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And welcome back. Thank you, Venerable. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, questions, I guess, Venerable, is it? Or would you like to carry yes. on with your talk? No, questions are always good. <laughs> Is there anybody who would like to put forward a question or make a comment or either in the chat or unmute and uh, ask something? Yes, uh, thank you, Sky. Let's go. Thank you, Venerable. <clears throat> Last time you uh, gave me good advice to keep my warm heart and wisdom to deal with a difficult situation, and it really helped. I thank you for that. Um, I had a question when you talked about uh, uh, not to be a fortress. Mm -hmm. um, I was confused for a moment with another example from uh, uh, another uh, uh, venerable to have a fortress for the for the sentinels, for the five senses, for the six senses that we have a sentry at every uh, portal, uh, the eye portal, the ear portal, the nose portal, to watch our uh, hindrances. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have double duty with our little fortress, um, to have a fortress, but yet not have a fortress. Not impenetrable, I guess, mm -hmm. or find the dividing line, uh, what are the good uh, mindful qualities to to stay uh, with wisdom, mindfulness, and, and, and still yet be open for uh, people and places, um, things that bother us, that to look at it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted a little more detail from you on that, the fortress mm -hmm. thing. I think you know what I mean. Yeah. The fortress... The, the metaphor that comes in the, in the text is regarding meditation is that when we start to settle the mind, the mind will always go out to those different doors. It will go out to things that it hears, things that it smells, things that it feels. It's constantly going out because it's trying to get away from itself in the space it's built. So by watching, by closing off those doors, we can go in deeper. So in a meditation context, that's very, very useful because we're basically allowing a space for us to just be here. That this is a time for meditation. This is a space for meditation. All the rest of the world, for the time being, it can just go about its business. This is a meditation time. The fortress in the other way is that deep down, we know what the world is like. We know all about impermanence. We know all about the fear of chaos, old age, disease, death, pain, all that. We know all about the fact the world is not under our control and that we are basically at risk from the world. And what we do is straight away we put up our gut. How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to navigate this world? And we instantly create this dualistic way of living. You, me, you know, this is me, this is a chair, every way that we can navigate the world. And that's perfectly rational and fine. But all of a sudden, the more we do this and the more we interact with the world, and the more, or we should say, the less that it works, so to speak, the less control we get, the fact that it isn't changing the nature of the world, our fortress gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we put more stones up to protect ourselves from the world, to protect ourselves from other people. And then we become unable to interact with the world. We've closed ourselves off. So the price we pay for that sense of safety and security, which grows out of, you know, ordinary way to live our lives, the ordinary way to interact with each other, just to navigate this world, 
becomes a prison. And that's, so there is a bit of a difference there between keeping the, the doors of the senses closed so that we can go in, so we can settle and be peaceful, versus this defensive, fearsome, you know, wall that we put up, the firewall, the fortress, and attack anybody who comes with it and pour out the boiling oil and all the rest, and fire up the cannons and attack anything that comes. And the fortress is a prison. And this is the thing, you, if uh, you ever have the chance to travel to, to Europe or the UK, which I did many years ago as a child, and go into these old castles, you know, they're not very pleasant places. <laughs> they're big defensive places, but uh, they're, they're terrible to live in. And this is the way that we live our world. And yet, when we are in our own little fortress, because it's unpleasant, we become bitter, we become angry, and we take that out on other people because of our own feelings inside. It's kind of this lose-lose situation. And yet, the way to loosen the fortress is to no longer build it up. It's to be a bit more open. But of course, the mindfulness and wisdom comes in that we have to kind of gauge at the beginning when it's safe to do that. Because the mind's constantly saying, whoa, whoa, whoa we can't deal with this, not going there, shut it out not going there. And so the more and more mature we are, the more wise we are, the more the mind trusts us and going, oh, we can handle this. This is okay. We can open up the windows a bit and then open up the doors a bit and then let the walls go. And ah, good. I, I get that. Uh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Because I just saw it clearly that we, in our mindfulness, in our meditation uh, time, where we're training our mind, we use the fortress to, to strengthen and build trust with ourselves so that when we are having to live in samsara, that our fortress is uh, strong and trusting. Mm. And, and we're able to trust our decisions in who we, how we deal with people. Something like that? Mm. Yeah. So it's all about building that maturity with ourselves so that we can now put, let the firewalls down and we can interact with each other as human beings and we can enjoy life and enjoy our relationships. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, thank you. Ah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sky. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to unmute and ask a question? Uh, there is a question here. Um, can I read it for you, Venerable? Yeah, sure. Would that yeah. be okay? Yep. No problem. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, when I learn Dharma and see that reborn is suffering, fact, and the fact that life is suffering, separate, being separated from being loved and one and and, and death, it makes me feel pessimistic and sad. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the fact that my parents are getting older and weaker. Uh, how do we get out of this feeling of suffering and find positivity and motivation to be happy and to carry on in life? Oh, that is indeed the big question. Our relationship with that feeling is that we want it to go away. We don't have room in our heart for the fact that this is how the world is. None of us are getting any younger. But with the mindfulness and wisdom, we change our perspective and say, OK, none of us are getting any younger. Our parents are getting older. Let's spend the best time that we have together in a good way. And we change our priorities to really go for that. So we can use these feelings of what can lead to, into pessimistic states of mind very, very easily. We can become morbid by thinking of the impermanence and the suffering and the yada, yada, yada. We can become depressed. And yet, actually, we can use this as a tool to say, OK, let's adjust our priorities. Let's look at how we can make the best of this situation. Because our resistance and our fear and the fact that we, we don't want the world to be like this 
you know, it, it, it's painful to feel the world like this. It's depressing or, you know, that this is it. This is samsara. And yet that drags us down. That imprisons us. And we just can't get beyond that. And yet at the same time, because we can admit the impermanence and the suffering and all, that we will lose everything we love. That makes us value it so much more. So the things that all of a sudden cause us trouble then become incredibly useful to us, incredibly beneficial to us. This is a, thing, this is a strange thing. It's like the example I said before when I was a student many years ago working you know, in, in, on the project I was doing. The, the last person I thought I would get along with was the first person to come and help me on the project. Go figure. By changing how we, we view things, Many of these things that seem difficult and terrifying become so useful to us, so beneficial to us. We grow as human beings by recognizing impermanence and recognizing suffering. And that all of a sudden means that the kindness, the compassion become rational, become useful. Again, they're not just things that we do because we're supposed to do them to be good Buddhists. They become a way for the heart to live in this world without being dragged into the pessimism, without being dragged into the sorrow. And this is such a wonderful thing, but it all becomes part of being able to admit that these things are the way they are. And then we move forward and going, let's make the best of it. Let's use the time that we have together in the best possible way. So hopefully that helps. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> and I think I was muted too. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Okay, well, let's see. We've got another question here for you. Uh, I'm going through a difficult divorce and I'm mindful that my wife watches the channel, the channel periodically. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have read that out, actually. I thought it was leading into a question. I, I apologise. Um, here we go. Can I stay in my fortress as I appreciate the peace and quiet while giving letter to the people I love? I love them, but I struggle with living them. Hmm. The answer is yes. You have to work with where you're at. No one can go all the way at once. Uh, the, the, the mind can't handle it. There's so many deep inner fears, inner concerns, everything else, that we built up this fortress to be able to navigate the world. And that's rational. The problem is, is it gets stale and it gets, a, it gets a prison, so it can go too far. So we have to work from the position that we're at. And that may mean, essentially, at the beginning, doing a home renovation to the fortress and putting up some nice curtains and some nice things to, <laughs> to make it nicer. But uh, eventually, we hope to let go of the fortress altogether and be free of it. But of course, if we're not ready to do that, if the mind isn't ready to let go, because it will all by itself, if the mind has those fears and concerns and doesn't trust us that we can do this or doesn't trust the other person, that fortress is just going to be there and that's okay. So in this particular instance, we, we still do the best we can with it. This is the position that we're at. This is where we have to act from. It's, it's, it's no, no good, so to speak, to envisage ourselves fully enlightened under the Bodhi tree and acting from there. Sometimes it helps, but a lot of the time it's being here now, so to speak. We have to be honest to where we're coming from and where we're at. And that's how we can move forward. So I hope that helps a little bit. Well, I think I'm sure it does, Vinnable. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here also in the chat, uh, unless anybody would like to go ahead and um, ask uh, another question, unmute and ask a question. Here we go. Oh yes, thank you Martha, that would be lovely, please, please. I'm just wondering, is my world small? Well, there's so many things I don't know about, but you know, the Buddha also talked about how 
from my readings, I don't know if it's true or not, but you know, it's from my readings, maybe from what Buddha taught or something like that, about how it's better to be alone than with the immature. If I'm, because I've been constantly, or I was in situations where I was constantly surrounded by just negative, bombarded by negativity constantly. And I am one of these people, I'm going to be happy. But if people, anyway, can you speak to just if one is tr kind of trapped in a situation where people are constantly talking about others, about their own, just complaints, negativity constantly. And because you said that it's, it's like a prison if we don't let ourselves out. But I find it's much more, I enjoy solitude. I'd rather be alone than with people who are constantly dragging me down with negativity. Is there any way to speak to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, the solitude and the seclusion is very, very important in Buddhism. In fact, one of the, the most influential verses in the Mahamangala Sutta says, do not, serve the wise, uh, do not serve the foolish, but associate with the wise. So very much so, it's far, far better off to be with wise people than to be associating with negative people, with ignorant people, with bitter people, with angry people, because firstly, they're going to drag you into it, and it affects you all the time. All the stuff's coming in, and we don't know how to process it. Ajahn Chah has this wonderful simile that as monks, you know, we're supposed to be rubbish bins with, with the bottom cut out so things just fall right through. And that's a very, very useful way of looking at it. So the stuff that just comes in, all the difficulties, all the misery, all the complaints, yes, yeah, fine, they're human beings, they have a right to their own opinion, but we don't, we don't have to be affected by that. It can just flow right past us. We don't have to hold on to it. So again, we have to work with where we're at. And if we're surrounded by these people and we can't go beyond that and we're just feeling oppressed and restricted and everything else, yes, the mind will automatically build up a fortress to, to protect ourselves from that. It recognizes this is not good for us. Back off, so to speak. So it's a completely natural, rational thing to do. And in this instance, we can't necessarily navigate that. We can't change them. Hopefully, we can find ourselves a better way, how we can deal with it. And that's really, there's always this balance between the seclusion, staying away from problems, because certainly in the monastery, we, we interact with so many people all the time. Sometimes people are, are wonderful and happy, and sometimes they're seriously unhappy, but sometimes they're just angry and bitter and resentful and complaining all the time. And we have to be able to just let that flow past. This is what they're pouring into their mind, into their heart. And it's not going to be a pleasant place to live. They're building a fortress just as we're building a fortress to be able to navigate the world. And their fortress is a pretty horrible place. And because they're stuck in this horrible place, and uh, you know there can be that resentment, so they lash out and complain and just be bitter and angry. But of course, they can complain that things aren't going their way. Or, of course, they could be complaining about all the chaos in the world, all the problems with the geopolitics and all that stuff. It's, it's endless. And admitting that it's endless actually is very empowering because it means that we don't have to get involved with it. We can give ourselves permission to say, OK, you, you're free to have your opinion and everything else, but I don't have to take this with me. You know, we can be the, the rubbish bins or the trash cans, as they say in the state, with, with the bottom cut off and things just fall right through. So uh, does this kind of help? Because this is actually a very, very big question. Yeah, it's very helpful. Hmm. It's very, very helpful. Actually, I come to think of it, my best friend, I do that with my best friend, actually, to tell you the truth. He and I are so different, and um, he's very, very negative about the world, and I'm very hopeful about it. And so... I come to think of it, I do know how to do that. But maybe it's because, I don't know, but it's a, good, it's a good place to start if I could extend that sort of loving kindness to myself mm. in that moment. Even when I'm with, say, for example, a family member who's closer to me rather than my best friend who lives next door, I may, may not be so, oh, goodness, I can't breathe. You know, mm -hmm. that is very helpful. 
Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> thank you, Venerable, and thank you, Martha, too. Uh, I've got another one to read, if you'd like, Venerable. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you forgive someone who has passed, who is responsible for, with others and with yourself, affecting current relationships? How do you check yourself? Uh, is it possible to forgive and move on? Deal with guilt, even if there isn't a reason to be guilty, other than the guilt that that you have been, that they have made you feel. Mm. Yeah, the guilt is an interesting one. A lot of the times, we are conditioned to feel guilty. We're conditioned to feel ashamed for things which have nothing to do with us. You know, as if this is our problem and we should be fixing the world, or you know. We are conditioned from a very young age, both culturally in our family and everything else, in certain ways, to feel guilt, to feel shame and all these things. So we are already sensitive to this and people can play on that. The problem basically is how do we forgive? We have to consider for a moment what it's like in their mind. It might be a horrible, horrible place and that is affecting how they're living and how they're acting. But forgiveness is an interesting problem. Because to forgive is to be free. But at the same time, to forgive can also be problematic if we do it openly. So if there's a person who may be in an exploitative relationship, you know, somebody is being, uh, it's, it's often called a codependent relationship and all these kinds of things, where there's a figure there who's basically using the other person, gaslighting them in all these psychological games. And if you forgive them openly, they sort of, you know, you're, you could just be encouraging them. You could be enabling them to continue um, a, a toxic relationship. So this is where the wisdom comes in. Compassion is very, very useful for us to be able to understand the situation that they're in it can be particularly unhealthy, and that's shaping how they're acting because they're experiencing the same uncertainties and impermanence and suffering and all the rest of it that we all feel and they are acting from their vested interests. So the rules that I mentioned earlier are controlling their lives. And so they're just being puppets to the greed, hatred and delusion and fear and everything else. So we can forgive very easily when we recognize a situation where they're coming from and the situation where they're in. But that of course can be difficult. You know, if there's been so much pain in ourselves that we've been on the receiving end of so much exploitation and abuse and everything else, we have to have that kindness and compassion for ourselves first because we can't give forgiveness to someone else in a true sense if we can't heal ourselves, so to speak, because then we're just enabling other people to act in a very unwholesome way. So the mindfulness and wisdom has to come in here and it works hand in hand that we gauge the situation to the best of our ability and step back for a little bit and say, okay, what really is going on? This person might just be difficult because it's how they were brought up and they are looking for, they're following their vested interests, but it, they're not necessarily a bad person, you know? Whereas uh, there's cases where they aren't a person that we really should be in a relationship with. So it's, it's really choosing in between there and we have to, at, at times, tread quite carefully. But forgiveness is always important. If forgiveness is very liberating because uh, if we cannot forgive and if we're made to feel ashamed, afraid, guilty, we are their prisoner. They built a prison for themselves in their fortress and now they've got us as a prisoner to live in there with them. Uh, that's, that's not a good way to live. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to live that way. So hopefully that helps. But again, very big question. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Thank you for the answer, Venerable. I have another one for you. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Impatience is something I've dealt with all my adult life. I grew up with a strict upbringing with high standards expected of me mm -hmm. and find it hard to be forgiving and patient with my loved ones at times. I've gotten better with my Buddhist practice, but the impatience does pop up time to time. 
I feel bad afterwards about my behaviour. It's hard to break ingrained habit in light of me trying to have things my way. I try, try transforming it with meta, but it's sometimes quite hard in the spur of the moment. Any other tips? Yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. This one is surprisingly common. Uh, many of us have been brought up in, in similar kind of environments where we are expected to reach very, very high standards. Uh, it's not only a, a Western thing, it's certainly an Asian thing to you know, be top of the class and everything else because it's so hard to get a job in many of these countries. We have to sort of aim very, very high. But because we've been forced to hold ourselves responsible and to achieve these high, sometimes unattainable goals, we expect other people to do that because we have expended so much energy of ourselves, so much of our own lives has been invested in this. And so we get very, very upset if other people don't live up to our expectations. We as human beings are very energy conservative. So if we're outside in the garden doing a whole lot of work and the person who's supposed to be helping us isn't you know, sitting inside in front of the TV with a muffin, that upsets us. So in this particular instance, it's recognizing that where we're coming from is conditioning and that that's okay. But at the same time, we have to recognize that yes, this isn't a helpful way to live. And the big question we have is, if we didn't have, you know, if I had my own choice in this matter, would I have this conditioning? Would I have these habits? Would I have this impatience? And if the answer is no, that means that you already understand that we don't need to live that way. It isn't helpful to us. And that's a fantastic strengthening awareness to, to have, is that we don't have to have it. Yes, these are old habit patterns, and they are very, very difficult. But when we recognize that's just what they are, they're just habits. We don't need to be ruled by them. All of a sudden that compassion comes in for ourselves, that we've had to fit in and achieve and do all these impossible things. And we're resentful because we were put in that position a lot of the time. So we can have that compassion and kindness for ourselves. If we can't have that for ourselves first, we won't be able to give it to others. There will always be that bitterness and that resentment that we have to be nice and friendly and loving to everybody else. But in here, we have to be perfect and in control and achieve and be the breadwinners and the fixers and the providers and the, all these labels. And that, uh, that actually is, is imprisonment. And the freedom comes in by recognizing that if we had the choice in the matter, would we really be that way? And the moment we can admit that to ourselves, we recognize that we don't have to be that way. And that's very liberating. But uh, uh, to hold yourself responsible for the way that you've been brought up uh, is, again, reinforcing the situation, unfortunately. So we have to forgive the past ourselves and to recognize that, okay, it's part of us, but we change all the time as human beings we can change in a different direction. When we recognize that we don't have to continue these patterns, we can replace it with something more beautiful. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, I'm sure it does. Is there anybody else who would like to unmute and ask a question? Or... Can I ask a question? Mm. Oh, that would be lovely, Gloria. Yes, please. Yes. I do think that expectation in relationship causes a lot of suffering and for most of the time I'm able to let it go, like not holding other people to too much expectation, but I think it is extremely hard for me. I'm trying to forgive my parents because like I think it's extremely hard to do when it comes to parental like parental relationship because I I kind of think that that is a very basic thing to do, to give birth to your children and to take care of them mm. rather than hurting them. And I think because I see it as a, such a basic thing to do, and when my parents failed to even do that, I think I kind of unable to like let the expectation goals because I keep thinking like they should have, they should have been able to like they, they should have done better 
uh, rather than what they had done. I kind of understanding that they are restricted by their environment and upbringing, and maybe their uh, family as well. But I just cannot like. I just kind of cannot let that go, and I just think that like. Emotionally, saying that they should have done better. Yes, how to how to navigate in this situation. Thank you. Mm, yeah. um, a, a way to answer this in a slightly sideways thing. Do you feel the longing to have had a happy childhood, a more free relationship with your family? Do you feel a longing for that? Definitely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I I really <laughs> see how much. I, I would say not only me but like my brother also like suffered a very like very very much from from the way that we are like brought up mm. and I always see other people and then I will kind of like I think I want to have that but of course because my family I'm not able to have that it's like kind of yeah I'm super longing for that to be to be sure. Yeah. This is, this is a very, very sort of big question. This longing that we have continues all the way throughout our life. Because when we look back at the past and saying, oh, how it could have been, how it should have been, that unfortunately entraps us and we're stuck in these patterns because we have regret, we have disappointment, we have bitterness and resentment oh, it should have been like this, the world should have been like that, my family should have been like this. And it's very, very difficult for the mind to be able to let that go. And the reason it's so difficult is what we've done is we've made that a very big building block of our fortress. So we've made that part of our identity. And so, yes, to admit that, yes, that's their conditioning and everything else, uh, you know, it sounds easy, but a lot of times it's very, very difficult because in ourselves we feel the pain, we feel the regret, we feel the longing and the wish that it could have been better. And we, unfortunately, because we continue in that little world, so to speak, that becomes the fortress, that becomes the prison. From this position of defence, basically, against how our parents have treated us and how it could have been, we feel safe and secure. We can navigate the world from that, even though it's not pleasant, we can navigate the world from that position. But it is still a fortress. It is still a prison. And it fills our heart for a desire, a longing for it to have been different. And we have to change that longing instead to recognizing that we don't have to be imprisoned by this. We can let it go. They are conditioned for that. They are brought up that way. And how they were essentially like robots programmed to treat us that way as children and so on. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to be able to let all this go because to let all of it go comes the emptiness. It's like, well, what do I do now? Where do I move forward? A lot of the time, people who have had very difficult upbringing, that trauma, even if they have to keep a blank face and be polite and formal and everything else and never talk about it, it's still there, but that trauma itself becomes our fortress and we, we're, we can't feel a way to let it go. And so by bringing in that kindness for ourselves acts a bit like a replacement mechanism. It gives the mind a sense that, oh, there is something different. We don't need to be imprisoned by this. We can open up the windows and let the fresh air in and let the light in. And then we can open up the doors and let the walls down. And we don't need to carry all the stuff from the past. But it always comes from bringing in that relationship with ourselves first, admitting, OK, yeah, this happened. But where do we move forward from this? Is it really worth carrying this for the rest of our lives? And uh, uh, there becomes a little bit of a priority debate inside of us. Because if we are experienced enough at meditation and kindness, the answer will be, no, it's not worth holding on to this, let's move on. But if we're not there yet, there's this priority shift saying, well, actually, this is really important to us. This is, defines who we are, right? 
I'm much happier with this because now I know who I am and how I can navigate the world. Even though it's a position from suffering, it gives me a sense of security and I have priority for that rather than priority for happiness. So it's all about finding out in ourselves what is it that the heart truly wants? What is it the heart truly wants? And then once we get in contact with that, we can move forward. But uh, this, is, this is a meditation life and it's, very, it's wonderful, but it is challenging. <laughs> we have to face some things, uh, but it is so liberating to do it. So hope this helps, but again, very big question. Um, did you want to ask something a bit more about that? Yes, I think I think it's it's good. I I do understand that like um, letting go is a natural process. Mm. That I think I do think that when you give yourself, when you experience love and care, no matter if it's from yourself or from other people. Mm -hmm. Enough, then you will be able to let those things go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's the longing, the longing for the love, a loving relationship with your parents as a child. That's the the emptiness of love in ourselves. So if we fill that with loving kindness that we already have in our heart by the bucket load, we with so much love and, and compassion in our hearts, but uh, we need to let it flow into that that longing and replace it and then we become free. So thank you for the question. Yes, thank you Gloria and thank you Venerable for the answer as well. Venerable, would you like to give us a blessing for the evening? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Bahu sa chan cha se pan cha wina yo cha se se ki to su ba se ta cha ya wa cha e That's it. What that means briefly, having lots of truth, lots of skill, lots of good speech, this is the highest blessing. <laughs>